At one point, I was public enemy number one. Now I'm probably public enemy number 11. Whether I'm found innocent or guilty is going to affect nations. It's going to affect how justice systems are perceived internationally. Five or six years ago, JK and I actually had some disagreements, but it looks like she's finally come to senses and reason. Unless Taylor Swift starts going to jail for everyone who crashes a car with a Taylor Swift CD in, everything that's happening to me is unjustified. Do you believe in gender equality? That's an that's a trick question. No, it's, it's quite an No, no, no it's, it's a trick question. It's, it's, it's fine, sir. It's fine. I've been around the block. If I was telling men to put a wig on and become a girl, I wouldn't be going through any of this legal trouble. Not a single drop of it. And here I am, a beacon of success. Brilliant. Tall, strong, smart, and funny. So it can be done. And humble. Hello and welcome. I'm Riz Khan. There can be few people in the world today who divide opinion as deeply as the British-American influencer Andrew Tate. To his supporters, and they number many millions on social media around the world, he is an inspiration, a motivator and a truth-teller, a courageous voice who's unafraid to speak loudly about money, masculinity and what he calls the matrix, an unseen elite that he believes seeks to control the masses. To Tate's detractors, he's at best a loudmouth millionaire who spouts crackpot messages to expand his social media-based fortune or even a dangerous zealot peddling misogynistic theories to an eager audience of young men with dangerous consequences for the next generation. Either way, Andrew Tate's message is getting through to his audience. Schools from London to Sydney are facing an uphill battle to counter what they regard as his harmful impact on students' opinions on gender issues. Raised in a low-income family in England, Andrew Tate is a former professional kickboxer who made money through online businesses, including webcams, that have been questioned as potential avenues for trafficking and exploiting vulnerable young women. Well, Tate converted to Islam a couple of years ago, having been raised as a Christian and then later declaring that he was an atheist. Today, he is under house arrest along with his brother Tristan, awaiting trial in Romania, facing charges of rape, human trafficking and forming a criminal group to sexually exploit women. And last month, the Romanian court agreed that after the trial takes place, the brothers can be extradited to the UK on additional charges of sexual aggression dating back more than a decade. Well, the Tate brothers deny all charges. I travelled to Bucharest to question Andrew Tate about the charges, his views and his faith, as well as the prospect of a life behind bars. Nothing was off the table as we discussed truth, fake news and the new role of role models in this, the first of a two-part interview. Andrew, thanks for making the time. Thank you. Now, you're awaiting, as we talk, you're awaiting a uh, trial here in, in Romania. What's the latest on that? Yeah, it's going to take a while. It looks like the Romanian judicial system often takes years to come to a conclusion before they eventually say I'm innocent. So the system has, it put me in jail for 92 days and then I was released. Under Romanian law, I could have been kept longer. So I guess I'm happy about the fact that I'm free. I'm very sure of my innocence, but it's a long process. And in many ways, I thank God for giving me this experience because when you grow up as a young man, you dream of being an explorer, an adventurer, or being ma monumentally successful and having a bunch of money and fast cars and seeing the five-star areas of the world. But perhaps if you want to truly explore the map, you also need to see the other side of it all. And I'm glad I grew up in a humble background and a humble beginning. And I'm also glad that I got to experience a Romanian jail cell and the Romanian judicial system. So it's God's plan. Well, you'd, you did say there's not much justice in Romania. Doesn't that kind of taint your position? Is there much justice in the world? Do you trust an American court nowadays with some of the decisions they're making? Do you trust a British court with the decisions they're making? What is court? What is law? It's the interpretation of words which were written long time ago. How can different judges come to different conclusions based on the same law? Why does the lawyer you hire even matter if the law is fair? Yeah, but I'm saying you're waiting their verdict here, so suddenly you've pointed the finger at them too. Well, I think that when you understand the world, you understand that nothing in life is certain that involves people. We can talk about the, one of the highest courts of the land, the ICJ. What is law? Like, what, what's being done about what's happening over there? Very little. So if you've ever been in a judicial process, you sit and understand that Innocent and guilty is certainly part of it, but there's also a bunch of other factors, especially once you get to a certain level of fame, when you become so well known that your verdict will ripple around the world and it will cause consequence for nations. Then you have to sit and say, okay, whether I'm found innocent or guilty is going to affect 
nations. It's going to affect how justice systems are perceived internationally. Does that mean they're 100% interested in what's true and what's false and what's fair and what's not? Or is there a narrative being played behind where they sit and say, well, perhaps he didn't do anything wrong, but we're going to look bad if we say he didn't, so let's just put him in jail. I'll get into some of those points in a moment, but uh, you've got civil court issues as well, accusers, and you've countersued. What would you hope to achieve with that? What happens when you reach a certain level of fame is that, and anybody who's been fortunate enough to move from the lowest echelons to the highest echelons will learn that anybody they've ever interacted with in their life is going to come along wanting some degree of money or help. And that's fine. But there's also a bunch of people who are bitter, who you perhaps knew in your past, who want to try and benefit off of your fame. And that's what happens. And this is not unique. This is not, this is not an experience that only I am going through. I think you can name nearly any famous man in the world and he has some form of civil charge against him for something that happened 20 years ago that he doesn't even remember that probably didn't happen at all because somebody wants to finance their life off the back of you. This is just human nature. You had your uh, assets, a lot of your assets, taken by the ruling authorities. Uh, any chance for getting those back? Well, I should get them back. What is law? What is court? What is a judge? What is fair? God is the only judge. And I truthfully have forgotten about all of them. I think it's around 15 million euros of cars, gold, watches, etc. I don't consider them mine anymore. I've forgotten about all of them. There's very little in this life you truly own besides your heart and your soul and your state of mind. I think those are the only things you can own. You can put me in jail, but I'll own my state of mind. I'll smile just the same. That's my decision. You can't take it from me. And everything else they can take from you, because unless you have enough guns to defend it, and you'll never have more guns than the state, it can be taken. You don't own houses, you don't own cars, you don't own anything else. And if you annoy the government, they're going to prove that to you. Doesn't this view contradict what you say about making money and being the alpha male and being the guy with the, the possession? Well, absolutely. I think that, I, in fact, I don't think it contradicts. In fact, I think it complements perfectly, because... When you work hard to be the best version of yourself so you can protect and provide for the people you care about, you're pleasing God. And you do that so that you can wake up and show him the beauty of his own creation. I can be the best version of me. I can make the people around me have the best possible lives. I'm not going to sit and be lazy or not try. And I believe that's all about building your character. It's not even about the money. It's about being the best version of yourself. If all the money in the world was taken from me, that's fine. Because I've still been a person who's worked very hard, been very diligent, who's very intelligent, who can make it all back. And I've also enjoyed this journey of life, which has brought me here with the good and the bad. And I think the greatest sin a man can commit in the world today is being a fraction of what he could be. I think that's the biggest sin you can commit in, in the face of your creator. I'm going to go on to your views on, on masculinity in a moment, but you and your brother Tristan spent time in Romanian jail, you mentioned. What was the biggest lesson you learned from that? What do you recall most, the worst period of that too? It's a good question. I think jail is just a hyper-condensed version of life as a man. You have to show other people respect, otherwise violence will happen very quickly. It's the same out here in the real world, but in jail, it's condensed. It's, it's pressurized. You have to have mental control. You have to have control of your own mind out here in the real world or you'll get depressed. Jail is the same. It's pressurized. So as long as you're good at life, you'll be good at jail. And I've never been a bully. I've never been an abrasive or aggressive person. I know how to respect people and make sure that I'm respected. And all in all, I don't think it taught me anything new. It just confirmed everything I knew about the realities of being human. Now, there is the chance you will end up in the UK uh, and in jail there. What, were, what, what did you think when you heard about the extradition notice? Really interesting because the UK has requested my extradition on some ancient charges from 2012. The warrant doesn't have any names. It doesn't have any locations. It doesn't even have any specific times. It only has a year. Quite interesting. I think the world is waking up to these tactics now. And I think the world is understanding that if you upset powerful people, they come at you with charges exactly like this. And I'm not the only one. We can name other people that has happened too. We can name somebody who's in Belmarsh right now because of it. So it's very common. It's actually quite scary, I think, that governments will come along and tell men at home to respect the rule of law. But sir, as a male, they could say to you in 2011, we won't tell you who, we won't tell you where, we won't tell you exactly when, we won't even tell you exactly what happened. You committed assault, you must come here and go to court. That's pretty scary because none of it makes any sense. What is refreshing is I'll get a jury trial and people are awakened to this garbage now because this has been happening for too long. And also I will not be looking at going to the UK for at least five to six years, at least because I have to finish all my Romanian proceedings. So this is on the later base for now. And I'll handle it when the time comes. I'm very good at just dealing with things when the time comes. That's who I am. And truthfully, I'll be very honest. I mean, 
not to go with the authorities in any way. I'm not scared of jail. Nobody believes it. A guilty verdict will not make anybody believe it. Everybody knows it's a matrix attack and I have no problems going to jail. So it's God's plan. And if I get a little holiday, then I'll take my holiday. Interesting perspective on jail. But let's get onto your, your quote about having three stages of life. You talked about first stage, you know, three, three challenges, if you cha challenge power rather. In the first life, they cancel you. In the second, they slander you, delete your access to social media and arrest and lock you away, which you said you've been through. And the third life uh, means they will assassinate you. Are you really concerned about that? I don't think I'm public enemy number one anymore. At one point, I was public enemy number one. Now I'm probably public enemy number 11. And you, the, you know, the, the old story goes, you don't have to be the fastest person when you're out running the bear. You just have to be faster than the slowest guy. I feel like I'm getting there now. But those are the three stages. When you say things that upset power, they try and cancel you. They delete your access to speak. They delete all your access to social media because your ability to speak freely is directly correlated with your insignificance. They allow you to say whatever you want if nobody listens. People start listening, then you have to be careful what you say. So the whole free speech thing is garbage anyway. So they, they cut that off. If that doesn't work, then they'll find a reason to put you in jail, which they did with me. Somebody told them, find something. They made up garbage. And I'm not the only person this happened to. And if that continues to fail, then yeah, they will kill you. Well, I wonder what you were thinking when Alexei Navalny, uh, the Russian opposition leader, ended up in jail and died there, some, somehow mysterious. I find that interesting, though, because I think the timing doesn't make sense. I'm not an expert on Russian, geo on Russian politics. I'm not an expert on the internal affairs of Russia. I'm not Russian. I just feel like it got Putin quite a lot of heat. And I don't feel like it was an ample time for him to just commit an assassination. He was under enough heat. He had enough things going on. He just did the Tucker interview, I believe. In fact, a lot of people in the West have respect for Putin now, maybe not amongst the elites, but amongst the general populace because he's nationalistic and he's very competent, which is something we're lacking in our leadership. It just didn't make sense for him to do a bad guy thing. The guy was already in jail. I understand he died from complications of the vaccine. That's what I understand, but perhaps I'm wrong, who knows? Well, there was also, uh, you know, a number of people who've gone undergone similar situations in Russia. So, I mean, maybe that's a different thing. Uh, I'll, I'll move on, though. Let well, me Russia's ask Russia. Yeah, no, Russia is Russia. I mean, I, I, every country has its own way of dealing with things, right? And nowhere's perfect. But I just think it's kind of hypocritical to us in the West. We look at all these other countries and we say, ah, oh, look, you can't speak over there. Oh, look what happens when you challenge power over there. Well, look what happens when you challenge power over here, my friends. Let me ask you about the, 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 you know, you talked about jail being kind of a reset for you, a little holiday, I think, the way you described it. Yeah. What is your fear, though, of actually having a long term uh, in prison? I mean, you know, do you fear of dying in jail? I don't operate in the realm of fear. I, I genuinely don't operate in the realm of fear. I have absolutely no fear of going to jail in Romania or England. I have no fear at all. I know I'm innocent. The world knows I'm innocent. Everybody knows this is a matrix attack. The idea that, uh, and I can prove it's a matrix attack. I can prove it because... Would ancient charges from 13 years ago be trumped up and tried to press against me if I wasn't famous, if I was a normal person? Well, of course not. It's because I'm famous and they're trying to prove a point. They're trying to damage my influence. They're trying to damage my reach. The girls or whoever these people are, if they exist at all, want money. All of this is happening purely because of my fame. If my fame was in the hands of the establishment, if I was working for the MSM, like these other people who work for the BBC who have been caught being sexual predators, well, then it wouldn't be on the news. They're only doing it against me because I'm against the establishment. The whole thing's a matrix attack. It's all made up. And when you ask me on my deathbed, whether it's in jail or it's out here in freedom, are you glad you didn't sell your soul and fall against power for what you knew was right, even though they put you in jail? My answer is going to be yes, of course. I don't care about a big house and a bunch of cars. That can be taken from me anyway. But I care about looking in the mirror knowing I'm the man I said I was. So I'm going to say what I believe. And if they want to put me in jail for it, then they can put me in jail. On a personal note, you and your brother, Tristan, were denied compassionately for when your mother, Eileen, was ill over Christmas uh, first, your thoughts on that and how it affected your relationship with her. It's very interesting, you know, this whole legal system, the whole legal process. It is very interesting because, like I said, you stand before a judge and you said, my mother's had a heart attack. Can I go see my mother? Here's the papers. She's had a heart attack. She might die. I haven't been able to leave this country for a year and a half. Can I go see my mother? And the judge will look at you and go, no. And, and it is what it is. I mean, it is. I don't know what to say beyond that. It's a very interesting scenario to be in. And this is where we go down to what's law, what's real, because there's a lot of judges who would have said, yes, that's perfectly legal. There's a bunch of judges who say it's no, it's not legal. You have one lawyer who says, ah, this is illegal. They can't do this. Another lawyer says they're not supposed to do it, but they do it all the time. They get away with it. it all of it is just words. 
Yeah, and, and when you look at it, it's not just the legal system. You start to understand this entire world. It's, it's just people walking into rooms and saying things. Government are just people walking in a room and saying stuff. And education systems, just people walking in a room and saying things. The legal system, the medical system, just a bunch of people chit-chatting. So how it all plays out, I don't know. You talk a lot about they. You know, they will get you. They will come after you. They have a mission against you, for example. And you refer to the matrix, uh, kind of an elite group of people who have an agenda yeah. and, and work together. I mean, is that really possible? Or is it just simply a great phrase, the matrix, and a way to kind of dismiss those who are challenging you and your views? No, it's, it's, I think it's very clear that this world is run on deception. I think it's very clear that there are power structures which are designed to enslave the minds of people so they'll continue to allow their bodies to be enslaved. I think it's very clear that there's people who can't afford to eat anymore and inflation's out of control and the standard of living is declining and crime is off the charts and they just try very hard to pretend that's not true with their various mechanisms of control. And powerful people have always wanted to exert control. And when I fight against or resist these things, I want the world to understand that I don't even take it personally. Even though they've put me in jail, I don't take it personally. I have 110 people who work for me. If one of them was particularly troublesome and disagreed with everything I said and didn't listen to me, I'd fire him. So if you run a country and you come along with your lies and your narratives because you want to profit or you believe it benefits you geopolitically and you want to sit there and lie to the population and the population believes it and then there's this one guy, this top G guy, who's saying, no, this is a lie and everyone's starting to pay attention to him. Well, then you're going to do something about it. Anyone who doesn't understand that's how the world works must live in some fairy tale land. That's how the world works. And I've upset very powerful people by telling the truth about very important things. The only thing is, when you talk about a matrix, it sounds like they're all colluding. And, and that's almost impossible. Money colludes. Money colludes. Power colludes. And you say, interesting you say that. I think the matrix is cracking in real time because people are being awakened to how much all of these systems based on fairness are simply a lie. They're simply a curtain, a distraction, a theater play to keep everybody believing in them. But you say that people can't collude globally around the world to exert power and control. I think there's a very interesting situation in happening right now, which is an act of genocide, where you can see certain countries can get away with whatever they want and other countries can't. And if that isn't proof of all the big money working together, well, then I don't know what, what more there is to say. Yeah, Andrew, what's interesting is people like yourself have a massive voice now, whether it's divisive or not, that's an issue, uh, but you have a massive voice globally because social media has given you this incredible platform yeah. at a global level. Um, it can have sudden and un unexpected consequences. Aiden Ross, another social media influencer, happened to, con uh, happened to mention that he thought you, you wanted to desperately get back to the UK. The outcome was the UK reacted and that triggered it. How, how did that affect your relationship with him? Yeah, it's, I mean, poor. You guys were friends before. Yeah, we're still friends. and. I'm in a unique situation. It is, it's kind of funny because this, this whole Aiden Ross thing, I'm not entirely sure that triggered the arrest, but you don't know. I'm very sure the Romanian state is extremely personally invested in my case. I'm very sure they understand their reputations on the line. They're very afraid of anything going wrong with this judicial process. But I'm here for the long haul. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to see it through to the end because I'm not afraid of them. So, yeah, the, the social media is social media, and there's a whole lot of crazy things that happen from it, but also there's a lot of good that happens from social media. I don't think people would understand a lot of the realities in the world today without social media. The veil has been lifted on a whole bunch of narratives that we've been forced to support for a very long time because of social media, which is why now governments in the West are panicking and passing laws trying to censor and stop social media. Free countries, democracy, free speech. Oh, no, 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 not when you say what we don't like. So now they're coming along and trying to stop it all. And I have to say that Rumble, which is the platform I'm on, and also X owned by Elon Musk, both of these platforms have been monumentally important for the freedom of humanity because I think we're entering an oncoming decade or an oncoming generation of slavery. You were blocked actually on pretty much everything and then Elon Musk uh, changed his mind and, and gave you that option. I mean, do you owe him a, a debt of gratitude? Certainly. I, I, I actually certainly do because although I think the narrative against me, most people would have ignored it and not believed it anyway because it's the boy who cried wolf and they've done it too many times. The fact I've been able to show the other side of the story has been extremely important. And also I've only been showing 5% of my side of the story. And this, this is where you go back to my original point, sir. When we talk about the reputations of entire nations, I mean, people say Romania, like, oh, it's only Romania. Romania is a, is a rich European nation. It's an EU member state. 
are they going to allow their entire judicial system to be seen as corrupt and incompetent by letting me walk after destroying my life for years? Or are they going to sit and say, we have to save face here? I don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. But the fact is, I've only said 5% of what I know about how garbage the case against me is on social media because I'm waiting for the conclusion of this. And heaven forbid I go to jail, at least then everybody will know the absolute truth about the setup they purported upon me because I upset the people in power. And, and that's how the world works. Another social media influencer, uh, Russell Brand, was uh, one also now faces charges and allegations against him. And you, you said uh, you know things about him uh, that people shouldn't or that other people don't. What, what in particular? Well, if I said that, then I'm not going to say them here. But I will say for, for sure that it's extremely coincidental when he started to talk the truth about the vaccine and how pharmaceutical companies operate that he then got hit with these charges. It's very interesting. I mean, anyone at home who believes these charges when they come out against somebody, let me explain how simple it is. You can attack a pharmaceutical company and say that they're killing people with a vaccine, for example. The pharmaceutical company pays a lot of money of a advertising revenue towards X media outlet. So they tell that media outlet, well, we're paying you. You better do a smear piece on this guy. Then they use the media machine, smear piece. They drum up as much hate as possible especially if they cancel all your social media at the same time they work together so you can't defend yourself. Then journalists start calling around everyone you've ever known or they inspire the police to decide to dig into you and call everyone you've ever known. And if they call 2,000 people who you used to know, they try to find a crime. And especially when crimes are so subjective now, especially in the West, right? And emotional coercion. So when police call 2,000 girls or 2,000 men who you used to know across a decade and say, did he ever emotionally coerce you? And they'll say, well, what does that even mean? And the police will say, well, convince you to do something effectively. And she'll be like, well, he asked me nicely to bake him a cupcake. I guess that's emotional coercion. Before you know it, you got a UK extradition warrant. And they're telling you in 2012, you were emotionally coercive. It's all a scam. It's a scam. And anybody who is sitting at home who believes any of these charges, which seem to always appear against powerful men who speak against the system, need their heads checked. Although the charges aren't exactly about baking cupcakes. Oh, well, the charges are about a bunch of, again, subjective garbage things. Emotional coercion. And I don't even know what my charges are. I haven't even been charged, sir. I, the UK government has not charged me. CPS has not charged me. They've just said in 2011, he told a girl to bake cupcakes. Regarding Russell Brand, one of the things is that for a long time, you, you said for a long time, Russell Brand was the establishment of the Matrix himself. Well, he was part of the mainstream news. Yeah, of course. So, well, why would they go against him then? Well, because he stopped being for the mainstream news. He worked for them and he was all over TV and he was dancing with all these girls and he had all these girls around him and they seemed to very much enjoy his company. And he was famous and he was on Channel 4 and he was doing Big Brother and he did all these amazing things. And then he stopped working for the MSM. He stopped, decided to start telling the truth. I believe he found God and he changed his life and he sobered up and started telling the truth about certain narratives. And all of a sudden, he's a criminal. Funny, strange coincidence. Is all the MSM, the mainstream media, that bad? I don't think they're that bad. Well, sorry. Let me correct myself. Most of them are. But when you say bad, is a snake bad? Is a tiger bad? When a tiger kills an antelope and rips his throat out, is it bad or is it just being a tiger? The MSM is just being the MSM. They have their interests, which is either money or a narrative from a government, which they're told to enforce. The BBC is told by the British government what they want the people to believe. They are funded by the British government. If you're not funded by a government, you're funded by advertisers. You follow the money. You do what the money wants you to do. And that's, that's the goal. I don't even see it as bad. I'm just realistic about how the world works. I'm not, a, I'm not a fantasist. A tiger is not bad for killing an antelope, and the MSM isn't bad for lying. It's just their job. So is social media the antidote? It can be. And it looks like it's doing a pretty good job so far. It's certainly, like I said, lifting some very important veils. But how this ends, I'm not sure, because as the matrix cracks, as governments and as these huge, powerful banking institutions and all these people who control the money lose their ability to blanket control narratives, there's going to be a lashing out. And I feel like we're getting there now with certain legislation being passed. I think Scotland passed one two days ago. A lashing out is going to come against people who speak the truth and a lashing out. I'm, I'm a victim of it myself. So it's kind of interesting. We've cornered the tiger of lies. And when you corner a tiger, they get extremely vicious. And we're going to see what happens next. It's interesting you raise Scotland because J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter, uh, now herself has been the target of this. Now, I wonder how you regard that case. Yeah, J.K. and I have actually had our disagreements. 
for, for it was five or six years ago, JK and I actually had some disagreements, but it looks like she's finally come to senses and reason. I think we disagreed on depression, but for a while she tried her very best to pander to these psychopaths who believe that a man isn't a man and a woman isn't a woman. She was walking the liberal line, as I understand. And it's very much like appeasing an alligator and hoping it eats you last. And eventually she's realized you can't appease these psychopaths and their parameters keep expanding and their insanity keeps growing. And eventually she said, no, enough is enough. And she's standing up and she's telling the truth and she's being brave. And for that, I commend her because that's exactly what we need more of. So there's the Andrew Tate who talks about current affairs. We'll get onto some of those, uh, more of those in a minute. But there's the Andrew Tate who's become known as this divisive figure when it comes to what a man should be and what role women should play. How do you regard that term they use sometimes for you, the king of toxic masculinity? Well, I don't even see myself as divisive, and I think 99% of the world doesn't see me as divisive. And you really what, think so? I really think so. And what they say is toxic masculinity is simply masculinity in most of the world today. In fact, even in the countries now where they're going to try and pretend my message is damaging and dangerous, I say to men they should go work hard, get strong, go to the gym, be mentally disciplined, be stoic. All of these things were accepted by the entire population 10 or 15 years ago. I haven't changed my views. I haven't come up with anything radical or new. They've changed the parameters of what a man is and they've lost their minds, not me. So I don't really believe I'm divisive. In fact, every single time a hit piece is published by me, published about me by the MSM, they turn the comments off. Please, you can check yourself. Every time the BBC, Channel 4, Channel 5, Australian News, whenever they try and do a hit piece on me, they have to turn the comments off because there's just thousands of comments saying you're wrong and he's right. A man should be a man and a woman should be a woman, and that's what makes families and society beautiful. I'll get into that in a minute, but I mean, there are lots of people who love you. There are lots of people who hate you. So that is divisive, isn't it? Well, I don't think you would have ever achieved anything in the world if you don't have certain people who hate you. That's fine. And there can be a contingent of the populace who hates me while I still remain eternally correct. I'm still right. That's fine. I mean, it's fine. And, and you could be the best thing in the world. It doesn't matter what you are. You can be a Ferrari and someone will hate you because you're too loud. I, I know what I'm saying is true. I know my message is overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive. I know I've had a massive positive impact on millions of people's lives. I know that in the end, as this arc completes and my innocence is proven, there's going to be a lot of people who have to apologize to me. If somebody wants to sit in their bedroom crying their eyes out because I said something they find mildly offensive, well, then I guess that's their problem. Do you think there's any chance that you may have also had a very negative impact on many people's lives? It's interesting you say that because I think if you actually want to be a professional, and like I said, I've analyzed all these things very non-emotionally, I think it's impossible to say anything positive doesn't have a negative impact in, under the right circumstances. There's no light without dark. Water is positive. You need water to live. You can drown in water. Music makes people happy. Yes, you can listen to music. You can feel happy. You can enjoy a party. It also sings about doing drugs. People become drug addicts. Like, I would like to believe my message is overwhelmingly positive. I tell people to train, to work hard, to make as much money as possible, to be stoic, etc. I'd be a liar if I couldn't sit here and say, well, I've convinced 100 million men to go to the gym and one of them dropped a dumbbell on his foot. Well, uh, maybe, perhaps. I mean, but what can you do? You have to speak in generalities. Exceptions don't disprove the rule. My law, the things I'm saying are, are generally good things and the rules are generally good. For, so for them to come along and attack me as they do, this is what's so in, disingenuous about the mainstream media because this is exactly what they do. I'll teach men how important it is to be strong, go to the gym and look after themselves. They will then see thousands of kids go to the gym and work hard. They will then find one kid who goes to the gym who's maybe autistic, maybe he's not socially well conditioned, maybe he had bad parents, who knows, who starts walking around the school saying, I'm strong, I'm strong, I'm bumping into people. Then they'll say, Andrew Tate did that and they'll attack me. That's as asinine, that is as foolish as waiting for somebody to crash a car and see that they were playing a Taylor Swift song and start saying that Taylor Swift fans crash cars. Because most people listen to Taylor Swift and don't crash their car. So the whole MSM narrative against me is completely disingenuous. The thing is, I don't think the, the divisiveness comes from saying to men, get fit and, and be- But it actually does. But it actually does, sir. And I apologize to interrupt. But it actually does. Australian News only the other day published some complete garbage about te some female teacher who had to quit her job because she didn't feel safe in the classroom because the boys thought that it was a man's job to be strong. Masculinity is under such attack now that it is an act of resistance and rebellion to tell men to train and get strong. You can sit and say, telling men to be strong isn't why they attack you. Yes, it is. Because when you tell men to be strong and have principles, they resist the slave programming. I'm telling men to make their own money, 
and to get strong physically and to protect the people they care about and to say no to the programming. That's what they don't like. If I was telling men to put a wig on and become a girl, I wouldn't be going through any of this legal trouble, not a single drop of it. If I was, if I was trying to convince men to castrate themselves, I'd be fine. But when I say, no, you're a man, you have to protect what you care about and stand up for what you believe in. No, then you're, then you're a problem. And it's a, and it's a problem because they're trying to enslave all of us. And I don't think anybody at home actually understands where this AI tech and where the world's going. They're trying to enslave all of us. And when you come in as a conquering army, the first thing you do is you destroy the warriors. It's always been the same. You kill all the military age males so that you're left with eunuchs, young boys who can't fight back and girls. And they don't want men who listen to me or men like me because they know we would rather die. And they don't like it. Should men listen to you when you say that you can have as many children as possible, that if you don't have at least 10 children and four wives, you're a pussy, pussy bitch, I think you said, and a genetic failure? I said, no, this is a very good question. And, and again, we look at, sometimes I say things in hyperbole or I say things sarcastically for comedic effect. I do believe that children are extremely important. I do believe a man should have kids. I do believe we need families. I do believe the Western world needs more children. In fact, the Western governments themselves believe in it. That's why the populations are declining and collapsing. That's why we have to import people from all around the world because nobody has kids. I believe a man's duty is to have children with the woman he loves, absolutely. If he loves more than one woman and he wants kids with all of them and they're all happy, consenting adults, I once again condone that. I think that a lot of the people running the world is strangely coincidental that none of them have kids. Have you ever actually looked at the people in the Western world, the people who are in charge of us, none of them have kids? Isn't that weird? Wouldn't you want to be like 65 and have no kids at all and just aim for the control of the entire population and to try and starve everyone to death? I don't know. Anyone without kids, I don't trust, and I'll stand by that. Some of the studies show that the reason the, the child uh, production rate, if you like, has diminished is because people are trying to do the other side of what you say, make money and be successful. I, I would, I'd agree with that study. I would agree that the reason people are now not having as many children is because they're chasing money. But I wouldn't say it's necessarily down to the fact they want to be overly ambitious. I think they're chasing money because their government has destroyed their ability at living a fair and free and semi-comfortable life on any kind of normal wage. So when they inflate the currency to the moon and when crime gets out of control, so you need to move to a more expensive house and when your living standards collapse, of course, you're not going to be trying to have kids because you're trying to pay your bills and the government's done that on purpose. Very few governments are actually making initiatives directly aimed at trying to promote people having children. Hungary's done it. South Korea's just recently done it. But most of the Western countries' answer is just to open the border. Let's but does, does that make them genetic failures? I wouldn't say, well, let me answer this carefully. If you fail to pass on your genetics, you have failed. Some can't. Why can't they? I mean, it could be genetic. Well, of course. I mean, but is that failure? Very, is that failure or misfortune? That's very, well, that's very misfortunate. But if you're a man and you're all alive for 80 years and you don't manage to have children at all, and not because of some misfortune. Again, exceptions don't disprove the rule. We're not talking about people who are incompetent in some way. We're talking about people who can do it and don't do it because they're too busy trying to get a promotion at some corporation. Well, I think that's a failure. I think children are the most important and beautiful thing on this planet and they should be your priority in all ways, yes. I know you say you say things for comedic effect, it's sardonic and, and so on, but there are so many young impressionable minds that listen to you. Oh, I, 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 how, how much responsibility do you feel to I, I feel massive responsibility. And I think that a lot of the things I say that have been used against me, I said 10 years ago when nobody knew who I was. And it's kind of unfair for me to make a video that gets 60 views 10 years ago. And now I'm the most famous man in the world. It's going to be used against me. Of course, now I understand that with my massive power comes massive responsibility. I have to be a lot more careful how I say certain things because a lot more people will listen. I respect all of that. However, once again, this is uniquely used against me. Why not correct them? Why not, why not correct them now and say, look, 10 years ago I said this, I don't believe this to be the case anymore. I think that this and this should happen. Well, I've done that, but I've also done, I've done that for all the important ones, but I've also done thousands of hours of interviews. And also in this sliding scale, this never ending tapestry of constant offense, a lot of the things I've said to you right here, right now, there's gonna be people who take massive offense to it. And there's gonna be someone else who's upset, some nobody, and I'm not really in the business of sitting down, apologizing to faceless nobodies all day long. People make these Twitter accounts, they have no fans, no followers, no face, it's Anon, or the MSM quotes an Anon source. All this is just made up imaginary, or people who have no relevance to society, and they sit there and say, Andrew, you offended me. Well, guess what? The world is harsh, the world is hard, you're gonna have to get over it and live your life. You don't have to read what I say. You don't have to listen to my videos. I don't care that you exist, if you exist at all. So you can just move on. I'm really not in the habit of sitting down and apologizing to a bunch of insignificant people. I'm not gonna sit here and dedicate my life to trying to make those people feel better.
I'm not thinking about the insignificant ones. I'm thinking about those who are your genuine fans who, who, for whom everything you say is like the word of God. Well, my genuine fans aren't stupid, right? I, my genuine fans aren't stupid. Once again, there may be one autistic kid who goes to the gym and walks around the school and acts like an idiot. I'm sure there's some idiot who's listened to 50 Cent and thought, that's it, it's time to shoot people and sell drugs. I'm sure there's some idiot who's done exactly that. But most people play his song and enjoy the song for what it is and then move on with their lives. I'm not going to sit here and assume all my fans are idiots. And I'm not going to assume they're all carbon copies of me either. I'm sure a lot of them like some of the things I say and disagree with some of the things I say because they're functioning adults, as we all are. I'm not responsible for the action of every single person who's ever heard an Andrew Tate video. And the world knows this, and the MSM knows this, and the police know this, but they're using it against me anyway because this is the Matrix attack. Unless Taylor Swift starts going to jail for everyone who crashes a car with a Taylor Swift CD in, Everything that's happening to me is unjustified. I'm sure you have a lot of fans who are autistic who are probably taking offense right now. I mean, do you have something against that? No, absolutely not. I would just, I just gave an example. And it's an example because I do believe that that genuinely happened. I do believe there was a child who watched my stuff, who had some kind of learning difficulty, who was repeating it over and over again. And, I'm, and I have to sit here and say, okay, I'm a man on the internet and makes videos. You're saying a child in Australia 3,000 years away 3,000 miles away with, uh, with learning difficulties, listen to what I said and repeats the phrases. I'm sure before he was repeating my phrases, he was repeating phrases from TV or from a song or from something else. How is this even my pro How can I defend myself against this level of attack besides do what they want, which is not talk at all. They're going to put me in a position where if I say anything, it's bad. If I say anything, it can be used against me. So the only way I can protect myself from somebody who I've never met 3,000 miles away repeating the words I've said on the internet is to not talk on the internet, which is what they want me to do, which is why they attack me with this garbage, and I utterly refuse. Andrew, you're considered part of the manosphere, this term that describes a disparate group of, um, well, not necessarily disparate, maybe cohesive in some ways, a uh, group of um, websites and blogs and, and influencers who have a very strong position on what masculinity is about. And you're put into that group, the manosphere, um, some of which is pretty extreme. How do you regard the Manosphere? I don't know who any of those people are in the Manosphere. I don't have any association with any of those people in the Manosphere. I can't speak for any of them. I don't know who they are. I can only speak for my own views. I would consider myself a political commentator, and I would consider myself somebody who comments on men's rights issues because nobody else seems to care. Nobody else seems to care that men commit more suicide, men are more homeless, men are the ones who are struggling in society today. We have no mental health support. Even if you look at something as simple as cancer, Breast cancer gets all the funding. Prostate cancer, nobody cares. Men are here to die, pay taxes. Nobody cares about us. Nobody cares about our feelings. And then they sit and say, oh yeah, men are depressed. That's strange. When I come along and try and offer a solution, they matrix attack me because the solution isn't the solution they like because the solution they like is to take pharmaceutical drugs and sit around crying at home. And I try and show something which is against the big money and against the big pharma. So I, I don't know who the manosphere are, but I am a man. And I will tell my story of how I live the best possible experience of being a man. And I'll help as many men as possible. And I'll highlight the difficulties that men go through. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Do you believe in gender equality? That's, an, that's a trick question. No, it's, it's quite... No, 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 it's, it's a trick question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fine, sir. It's fine. I've been around the block. That's a trick question. I believe the genders are different, but equally important. I believe in equality and importance. I do not believe in equality and capabilities. I do not believe a man can have a baby. I do not believe the average woman can fight combatively against the average man. I believe we're built differently. I believe God has designed us to be different. We are two halves of a whole. And when a woman is feminine and a man is masculine and we work together, we create perfect unity, which is why we're designed to be different. So do I agree in gender equality? Yes, but that term is hijacked. That term is used as a Trojan horse for pretending that all the genders can do the same things. And that's not true. This is what they do in the Western world. They hijack terms. They come along and say, you don't believe in gender equality. I say, yes, I do. I believe we're equally important. No, because you don't believe that a woman can do everything a man can do. No, I don't, because she can't. And a man can't do everything a woman can do. We do different things. So I do believe in gender equality, but I don't believe in the new version of it that they're trying to purport on the populace because it's deliberately used as a weapon. Let me ask you this then. You, a message you had for women was you said to them, we save you from the female inclination to make stupid choices. Yes. Don't you think men make stupid choices? Absolutely. But I would argue that women make emotional decisions more often than men. I think men make more logical decisions because life as a man is a more logical place and we have to ignore our emotions more often. Staying on the Titanic is not a logical decision. It's not the smartest thing to do. You just sit and ignore your emotions and say, this is what I'm supposed to do. Women are more often and more in tune with their emotions, which is a superpower, by the way. This is why they're better at a lot of things. This is why they outcompete men in many things. But 
emotional decisions can often be wrong because they're exactly that emotional. And if you look at any happy household, let's forget the Andrew Tate attack. You look at any happy household on the planet, there is a man who is man of the house and the woman comes to him for advice because he is the man of the house and he is more logical and more stoic and more cold and calculated. This is the way the world has always been and still is. And for anyone to pretend otherwise is a matrix attack. It is very much a generalization. I think there are very many strong women. I, and I noted that you said about the lack of the man in the house, uh, the disciplinarian, the person in charge is responsible for society's ills, knife crimes. Uh, this is all going men, this is, yeah, this is the lack of fathers. And yet, um, are you present as a father to your kid? Absolutely. Of course. Very all good. I do is raise my children. And I'm in a unique financial circumstance. The fact that I can have so many children is because I'm unique financially. I think Elon Musk also has 11 kids. So it's not uncommon for billionaires to enjoy offspring at all. I think Genghis Khan had a few more than that. But this is, this, this is common. But yeah, fatherlessness is the biggest pandemic. And when you say fatherlessness, I don't just mean a lack of man in the house. I mean a lack of man of character in the house. If the man is in the house and he's just soppy goo, well, then he's going to do his job, is he? But if the man's in the house and is showing the benefits of discipline and hard work, and taking the long road instead of shortcuts and doing the right thing because you're supposed to do the right thing as opposed to doing how you feel and ignoring your emotions and acting how you're supposed to act, well, then you're going to have a better society. So yeah, fatherlessness and lack of masculinity is what the society is what the society is suffering from. We need more masculinity in society, not less. And the fact they attack me and try and get rid of me is somehow toxic and to move everything into this feminine frame of feelings and maybes and take depressive drugs when you feel sad and it's all going to be okay and men should be more in touch with their feelings. All of that is why we are the way we are. Now, I don't normally bring personal stuff into my interviews. I'm, I'm very much there to hear the story. But I grew up without a father and I would say my mother taught me the right things too. She taught me what the right things were. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, surely women can also play that role. Absolutely. Mothers are extremely important. I mean, you say a lack of father, but in this case, the right kind of mother or a mother who can be strong. I would argue, I would agree with you, but exceptions don't disprove the rule. If you were to look statistically, most men, males who are from a single mother household are more likely to commit crime than from a dual parent household. What's interesting is I also, my mother and father split up at age nine and I spent all of my teenage years without seeing my father. And here I am a beacon of success, brilliant. Tall, strong, smart, and funny. So it can be done. And humble. And humble. <laughs> so it can be done. But we have to talk in generalities. And in general, if you have two parents at home, it's better for the upraising, especially of boys, because boys commit a lot of the violence in society today. And this is another thing I want to make very clear. When we try and feminize men, which is what they're trying to do, they're trying to feminize men, they imagine these soft, eunuch version of men who sit at home and cry all day. And that is perhaps true. You do get some versions of men who act that way. But when you feminize a lot of other men, what you do is tell men to act on their impulse and act how they feel. And that's why you get crime. Murdering somebody is an emotional decision, as is rape, as is all these terrible, heinous crimes that happen. They're men with no emotional control and no self-control, told by society to act how they feel, expecting them to walk around talking about rainbows and butterflies all day. And instead, when someone makes them mad, they pull out a blade and stick it in his neck. So this, the whole thing is garbage. They're destroying society by destroying masculinity. Andrew, isn't there a range, though? I mean, you're, you're suggesting a man can't be emotional. I, and yet no, you say you're an emotional man sometimes. Uh, no, I, I'm not suggesting they can't be emotional. I'm su suggesting they should have control over their emotions. We should feel emotion, and we should control them. A man should feel angry when it's time to feel angry, and he should control it. As with sad and everything else, there's a time you must simply perform and do the right thing. Just as the man on the Titanic, the men on the Titanic felt fear and ignored it and went into the water to save the women and children. This is the bottom line of masculinity since the dawn of human time is to do what you're supposed to do because you have a duty not to do how you feel. I'm sure the men in the trenches didn't feel like running over the top, but they had to because they were supposed to. That's what being a man is all about. And men should be waking up in the world today and say, I have to perform and act this way. I have to go to the gym, even though I don't feel like going to the gym. I have to make money, even though the economy is bad. I have to protect and provide for the people I care about. I have to do the right thing, irregardless of how I feel. And the reason this is so important, the reason this is so important is because a small contingent of men do think this way. And you as a man will never be able to outcompete the people who do if you're going to act on feelings. If you're only going to go to the gym when you feel like going to the gym, you're going to constantly lose to the person who goes to the gym, irregardless of how he feels, because he's there every day. And it's a very competitive world we live in, especially for men. And there's have nots and have yachts, and it's getting worse. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And if you're a man waking up in the world today in a normal life and you want to be anywhere, you have to be prepared to go against killers like me. With billions who work 18 hours a day, every single day, who don't have a day off, in jail, out of jail, doesn't matter, want more. 
And if you're going to compete against me, you don't have time to sit around being sad or you'll perpetually lose. And that's you're going to be a reality. You're going to be a loser. That's what's going to happen. What if people don't want to compete with you at that level? What if they don't want a yacht? That's they can fine. still be happy. That's fine. Of course. And they can still be happy. That's their decision. But if they sit at home wanting a yacht and not having one, well, then they have a problem then, don't they? It's interesting um, for, for a lot of people that the dichotomy of your life is an interesting one. Uh, you stated the view that modesty is fem feminine empowerment. Taking your clothes off on Instagram is not empowering. It's empowering to say that no man but my husband can see my body. Correct. And yet your, your past, this contradicts your past where you had women on webcams. Correct. And, and this is what you're accused of to a large degree. Well, accused them, it's not a crime. So put no, it I mean, I mean the sense that, you know, that, that contradicts, and especially, and we'll talk about you becoming a Muslim, but it yeah. contradicts your faith. Absolutely. And it's, that's the beauty of life. The beauty of life is as we grow, we change. And I've been very honest and open about the fact that I used to have a business which helped girls make money on the internet. It's kind of funny because I grew up in Luton. I grew up in a council state, single mother household. In a council estate, the most crime I was around, I was in the kids whose school who got arrested for murder. There was kids who stole cars and crashed the cars and died. My house was burgled three times. My neighbor's house was burgled. I knew drug dealers who were driving very nice cars at 19. I grew up around all the worst crimes. I didn't do any of them. None of that. What did I do? I helped people get traffic to a website. Oh, heaven forbid. If I wasn't famous, would any of this be even mentioned? No, of course not. So I did this back then. I was a younger man. I didn't know then what I know now. Now I have different morals and different principles and a different outlook on life, and I wouldn't do it again, of course. And I'm sure if you ask any 37-year-old if he thinks the same as he did when he was 21, well, they're probably going to say no. Jay-Z used to sell crack. He was a drug dealer. Now he's a mogul of the music empire. That's how it goes. That's life. Sometimes as a man, you got to get out of the ghetto. It is what it is. And I'm not going to sit here and say sorry for it or pretend to be sorry. I know that I didn't do a fraction of the bad things I could have done or was offered to do. I mean everything I said here. I mean that female empowerment is modesty. A woman who is powerful doesn't have to be ogled and, go and stared at by random men because when she decides to cover up, she's saving herself for the people she cares about or believes gets to see her. That is empowerment. I believe girls who get constantly naked on the internet are not empowering themselves. They're actually embarrassing themselves. I do believe that. Did I once profit from that 15 years ago? Yes. So you've evolved? Of course. Who, who, I, I think I'd be a fool if I hadn't. You can see the conclusion of my interview with Andrew Tate in the next few days on The Riz Khan Show here at Al Arabiya English. But for now, from me, Riz Khan, and the team, thanks for watching.